Open your Bibles. We are back in the book of Ecclesiastes today. It's going to be chapter 9. And before we uh, dive into this passage and uh, get into it, I have a special announcement. And uh, pursuant to the announcement by our governor, uh, next week when we meet, we will no longer require masks for our meeting. It's been a long two years, right? And uh, we've made it through that together. Um, I want to alert everybody. Um, I have spoken to some people who intend to continue to wear their mask. And you know what? That's okay. Yeah, yeah that's right. It is okay for those people. Um, reminder, the entire time through COVID, we haven't quite always known what's happened or what is happening with other people. We haven't known, perhaps, about uh, an immunocompromised situation of a person's life or an elderly person that they're regularly caring for. There's a myriad of reasons why somebody might continue to wear a mask, and if you are that person today, you're welcome to be with us. There's going to be a lot of masks come off next week, and mine will be one of them. Um, but I'm here to tell you, if you decide and you need to come with a mask on, that will not be, you will not be judged for any way in that, and there'll be a lot of uh, care given to you and, and love given to you. Well, next week's a big transition for us, and I'm looking forward to that, and so uh, we'll all get ready for that together next week. All right, your Bibles are open. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, I am going to be continuing in the series that I've called Chasing the Wind, and believe it or not, past this Sunday, just four more Sundays in this series... And the book is, for me, it's gone really, really fast. Can I remind you just what we're hap what's happening in the book and what Solomon's doing? Solomon's saying, um, I'm going to apply all my wisdom. And I've seen a lot of it. By this time, Solomon was a little bit older, probably, as king. He'd seen a lot happen. And he says, I want to apply my wisdom to try and out, find out the true value of some things that are common to human life and human experience. So he said, you know what? I'm going to apply my wisdom to find out the value of things like uh, money and things like pleasure, and things like work. Last week we talked about what it's like to have people in authority over us, and what is our response to that. And, well, spoiler alert, he says that all these things appear to be like vapor to him. He says, you think you can reach out and grasp them, and you can control them, but you can't. And so there continue to be, that the Hebrew word I continue to remind you of, it continues to be havel, or it continues to be meaningless, or vanity, or again, my favorite word for that, vaporous. It's something that you can't quite grasp. Well, today, Solomon is going to be dealing with the things and the way they appear in life. You know the saying, looks can be deceiving. Looks can be deceiving. We oftentimes use that about a person. Anytime we see somebody, we say looks can be deceiving, and that can be a very, very powerful thing about a compliment, but it all can also be, well, you know, hey, there's some sketchy things going on here. Looks can be deceiving. It can seem very good, but on the other hand, it's not. It could be around a person that you might say, wow, they seem to be a trustworthy person, but boy, I found out more about them, and they're not nearly as trustworthy as I thought they were. In fact, maybe they're bad and they're corrupt. In order to warm you up today on this idea of looks can be deceiving, and because I knew the kids were going to be with us today too, I have chosen a little video for us to watch. It's just a real short clip from The Lion King. And if you remember, Simba is the cub, and Simba has an uncle named Scar. Now, that probably should have been a tip-off that he was not a good dude, but nevertheless, uh, Simba here is all trusting because he's just a kid, and everybody's got to be, especially an uncle's got to be good. And so he's going to have an interaction with Scar, and Scar, little does he know, is actually planning his father's death. And so uh, let's watch the episode here from The Lion King. Now you wait here. Your father has a marvelous surprise for you. Ooh, what is it? If I told you, it wouldn't be a surprise now, would it? If you tell me. I'll still act surprised. <laughs> you are such a naughty boy. Come on, Uncle Scar. No, 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 no. This is just for you and your daddy. You know, a sort of father-son thing. Well, I'd better go get him. I'll go with you. No. 
No, just stay on this rock. You wouldn't want to end up in another mess like you did with the hyenas. You know about that? Simba, everybody knows about that. Really? Oh, yes. Lucky Daddy was there to save you, eh? Oh, and just between us, you might want to work on that little roar of yours, hmm? Oh, okay. Hey, Uncle Scar, will I like this surprise? Simba, it's to die for. And if you remember, it's at this point that Scar goes and starts the stampede of all the wildebeest that make their way down into the valley, and Simba is right there in the path of them, and Mufasa comes to the rescue of his son, but he loses his life in the midst of that. Now again, things are not always as they seem. Looks can be very deceiving, and Simba, if he would have picked up on probably one clue, it would have been the fact that his uncle had green eyes. That was meant to be a signal, right? This is not a good uncle. But looks can always be deceiving, and what we consider to be something that's, well, good in life, well, it could oftentimes be uh, playing some tricks on us. Let, let me give you a couple of examples of that, of looks can be deceiving. One of them was I had a panel kind of the, underneath one of my sliding glass windows or sliding glass doors at my house, and I could tell that some water was kind of getting behind that wood in some ways, and so it was a little suspect to me, and so I went to inspect that. And, you know, on the surface, I could see that the paint was still there. It was all in good shape. And, you know, by the look of it, it looked to be fine. But then I got a screwdriver, and I began to tap around on that wood. And at one spot, brrrp, right on through, and the wood behind it was rotten. Now, the paint had, hold, 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 had held up, and it looked okay. But if you really inspected it, looks can be deceiving. It wasn't really good. Let me give you a couple of other pictures that I want to show you. One of them is a fish on the bottom of the ocean. You can barely see him. You see his little orange lips right there. And all kinds of fish pass by and think that's just the bottom of the ocean. But no, if they get very close, they find out that actually is a predator fish that's ready to take a gulp and eat the little fish. Looks can be deceiving. Let me show you one more. Here's a picture of, well... What is it a picture of? Who can guess what that might be inside that plastic bottle? Somebody said olive oil. Somebody have another guess? Apple juice. And which one is it? Well, the label is off of that, so we're not quite sure which one it is. And you would really have to probably investigate that in order to figure out what is really in it because looks can be deceiving. Things are not always as they seem. Solomon is not necessarily interested in whether or not we can decipher whether or not that plastic bottle is apple juice or olive oil. That's not his interest. His interest is in bigger things of life for us. He's interested in the circumstances of life. And Solomon today is going to, by example, demonstrate to us that, well, things are not always what they seem. Things uh, can't always be trusted by just what you see on the surface. We build all kinds of mental models in the way things that are supposed to be. For instance, one of our uh, things that we would believe is if you get a good education, you're set for life. Or if, you if you're married, you live happily ever after. And of course, uh, things don't always operate exactly like that. Solomon will gonna, is going to take a minute to tell us a little bit about the instances of life in which looks can be deceiving. You think you automatically know the way this story is supposed to play out, but it doesn't always play out that way. You've noticed that I have not read the entire passage today. Uh, in fact, this week I'm going to do something a little bit different. We're going to read each section, and then I'm going to comment on it. And again, he's going to give us some examples of the reasons why it looks to me very deceiving. And he's going to tell us about some instances in which we think we know what's going on, but we really don't. Can I just tell you also this week, that this is a very difficult passage. 
Uh, if you read the whole thing in, in its course, which I did many times this week, sometimes I was just scratching my head and saying, what is going on with this passage? And it took me a while for it to kind of dial in for me. And I, I hope it makes some sense for you by the time today ends. But again, I'm just admitting on the front end of this, uh, this is a very difficult passage to get. I hope I can make some sense of it for us. We're going to start off with, again, his first example of looks that can be deceiving. And he says, looks can be deceiving when it comes to moral living. We automatically think that individuals who lead moral lives, morally excellent lives, are guaranteed to have better lives. I'm starting off in verse 1, chapter 9. This is the way Solomon puts it. But all this I had, to, to, uh, I had laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It's the same for all since the same event happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the evil, to the clean and to the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. The same event happens to all. Solomon goes through this list of contrasts, and there are contrasts of the poles of either a moral or religious spectrum. And so he's saying, I want to give you the spectrum of these moral conditions and tell you something about these people. And so again, I'm putting this list up here. Again, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad. By clean and unclean, he likely means those who keep kosher uh, dietary laws or those who are keeping the Mosaic law and those who don't. By the way, in that little framework, we all would be considered people who are unclean because we don't keep those kosher uh, habits of, of, of eating. Sacrificers and non-sacrificers, he means that people that are bringing a sacrifice into the temple and those who don't. He says good people and sinners Oath takers and non-oath takers, which means somebody who pledges something to God or makes an oath to God and those who don't. I mean, we could go on with that and we could say American League, National League, paper and plastic, Republican, Democrat. I mean, you get the idea. There's a poll here that's on a spectrum. And again, well, those last three weren't actually in the passage, but I added those. But you get the idea. And he's telling us something. He's saying, it would seem that it would be very beneficial to be on the good side. That if you were on the good side, then you would almost be guaranteed that you would lead a better life, that you, would, that you would have things that would happen in your life that would be just providential and beneficial to you at every turn. But this is what he says. Guess what? All those people, regardless of the condition in which you led your life, have the same outcome. Death is the outcome. Ray Stedman said this, our own death is the hard square peg that refuses to fit into the round holes we have planned for the future. And it's what makes us protest. Why should we learn all these great lessons of life just to give, to give them up without the opportunity to use them once we finally have mastered them? And maybe some of you have felt that way. It's like, well, I've spent a life of learning all these things and now it's cut short or seemingly there's a roadblock in some way for me to be able to practice that. Go back again to verse 1 and I want you to see something there because he says, man doesn't know whether love or hate awaits him. And by that he means with God. He says, with God... Most men don't know, he says, whether they're accepted or rejected. And this is what he means by that. We don't know if we just look at the conditions of what's happening in somebody's life. It's not easy to tell by just looking at them and the sequence of events that's happening, whether or not they are accepted or rejected by God. You can't look and know by their health or sickness about that, by their wealth or poverty about that, by their life or death about that. You can't tell whether or not God's love or displeasure is upon them by simply looking at the outcome. He says this is because, well, God's chosen people, you would think, would be the people of all people because they're God's chosen people that would have the easiest of lives. But, but we all know that's not the case. They don't oftentimes... Uh, God's people have the e easiest of lives. They're individuals who suffer misfortune. They suffer sickness. They suffer financial hardship. They suffer tragedy. And I, again, I could make the case that the Bible talks about perhaps the righteous people being the ones who have some of the most difficult problems. You think about Job. 
He maybe is one of our best examples. And Job is this guy that doesn't know that God really pleases, is pleased with him. In fact, considers him to be the most righteous man on earth. And Satan wants to have his utter destruction. And so there is this contest between God and Satan to see if, if Job will buckle. And Sa Satan is allowed to do all kinds of things in taking away from Job. And Job never knows about this contest and what's going on. Job's friends come to him and say, it's obvious. We've looked at your life. We've looked at all these calamities that have befallen you. You've sinned in some big way. A and he had not. Job was righteous through all of this. And yet all of these things happened to him. You wouldn't know by looking at him that he was a blessed man by God. You think of Abraham, God's first chosen Jew to make a whole nation out of this one man. And he says, Abraham, go to the promised land. He goes to the promised land. What immediately happens once he arrives to the promised land? There's a famine. A famine in the promised land. How can that be? And he's forced to go to Egypt. Had Abraham done anything wrong? No. He just arrives and that's the circumstance. It wouldn't seem to be that is a person that's greatly blessed by God. <laughs> you don't need to go any further than the life of Jesus himself. Denied, rejected, beaten, crucified. That would not seem to be the formula for somebody who's blessed and accepted and even is going to be glorified by God. And so again, what is happening here? You think about it on the flip side. The flip side of this is that individuals who seemingly have a great life, a, a life that's blessed beyond measure, if you look at it from just a worldly standpoint, and yet oftentimes there's some moral questions around those individuals. There's some things that are happening in their lives that, well, don't make them exactly squeaky clean. Let me give you a for example on that. With the war in Ukraine raging, there's been a lot of questions right now about sanctions. Sanctions against Putin, sanctions against Russia in order to have him withdraw from his attack upon Ukraine. And the talk this week was about Russian oligarchs. Somebody asked me the question this week, who's a Russian oligarch or what's an oligarch? And again, a Russian oligarch is a friend of Putin's who is now a billionaire likely because they received lucrative contracts in Russia in exchange for their loyalty and support to Putin. So they handed out all kinds of contracts to individuals and those individuals are now called these Russian oligarchs. And so the thought is, again, if you can get to the oligarchs, you can get to Putin. And so again, they've begun to sanction some of those oligarchs. Some of those oligarchs that have, well, more money and, than we can even imagine, than, than our, probably our entire city has. They have yachts and penthouses and luxury cars and jewelry. And one oligarch even owns a, a soccer team in Europe, in, in England. And so again, you look at the circumstances of these individuals and you'd say, if you just looked at their, their wealth and the la lavish lifestyles that they lead, well, obviously they've got to be blessed in some way. But when you consider their duplicity, well, then you say, why does God even allow them to live? Looks can be deceiving. And Solomon's not telling us it doesn't matter how you live. No, he, he's saying it greatly matters how you live. But if you just look at the outside of a life, you don't completely understand what is happening with that life, especially when you consider, uh, again, the moral condition of somebody. Death is the great equalizer, is what he says. It's going to visit all of us. And so that's the first example of looks can be deceiving, is that moral conduct does not guarantee an easy or a carefree life. All right, let's go on. The next one we're going to pick up is skill. And that's the second example, is applying skill to life, and looks can be deceiving in that. We automatically think that people who have more skills are going to automatically uh, lead a life in which they have more opportunities and they, uh, they excel more than individuals who have lesser skills. I'm picking up now in verse 11, chapter 9, verse 11. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those who wish, who, who, who with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all, for man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time, when it suddenly falls upon them. 
And so again, he gives us some categories. And the categories that he gives us are individuals that would seemingly have all kinds of skill that would allow them to uh, move very quickly through life. Here, here's the list of, 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 of skills that he has here. He says, the swift are the ones that win races. The strong are the ones that win battles. The wise are the ones that have food arrives. The intelligent are the ones that have wealth that builds. The knowledge are the ones that have the knowledgeable people are the ones who have favorable circumstances. And he builds this case of saying, this is the way we think life should work. You have more skills, you get more goodies, you win. But you know what? That's not always the case. Let me give you an example of that from the world of sports. If some of you saw the Pro Bowl, and I love the skills competition of the Pro Bowl rather than the Pro Bowl itself, the Pro Bowl itself is rather boring. I mean, they're just kind of going through the motions. But if you look at the skills competition, there's all kinds of fun in that. And by the way, I'm one that's an advocate that says, for the Pro Bowl, we should just go have them play softball. I think we'd enjoy that more than actually watching them play the game in which they kind of fake tackle. Uh, the skills competition this year was one in which Russell Wilson, well, he was lights out. I mean, he was awesome. In fact, I've got a picture here of Russell Wilson at the skills contest, and he buried everybody with points. He was more accurate in his throwing. He, I mean, he, he, he just put on a clinic of what it means to have an NFL arm. And again, you would say, uh, if he has more skills, he should probably exceed more, and he should be successful. And well, we have one ring. We would like more, right? But we, you know, we have one ring to show some of his prowess. But you know what? It doesn't always work that way. And there is a quarterback named Ryan Leaf. He was uh, drafted in 1998, second in the draft. So, I mean, that's very high in the draft. He's a WSU product. He even had a short stint on the Seahawks. But in a word, his, his, his NFL career was an entire bust. Uh, this is the way one person put it. His career was shortened due to poor play, bad behavior, injuries, struggle with his team work ethic, and his ability to stay focused. Those are not good things that will make sure that you have a long NFL career. And so again, the number two draft choice, which is usually almost a guaranteed lock for success, and all the skills that it took to get to that space... And well, it didn't pan out. And we would continue to build in our minds that more skills always equal more success. If you're a Harvard grad, it's almost instant wealth automatically. If you have an, a high IQ, it means you're going to probably hold some important position, maybe with the Department of Defense or something. And we build this case in our minds, but well, Solomon says, looks can be deceiving. It doesn't always work that way. And he uses two little words here that I think are so instrumental. He says it doesn't work that way because of time and chance. Time and chance come along and they work together in ways that, that, that make it so that suddenly our future is out of our own hands. Time and chance, they're working always in all of our lives and again, by chance, he doesn't mean here luck. That's not what he means. He, he's not trying to say, well, you know, that's just kind of the way things happen. It's fate. No, that's not what he means. By chance here, he means things that we didn't know were operating in the background and we were not aware of. There were some things that were happening over here and we didn't see that train that was coming that was about to hit us. It was just kind of happening over there. And the chance, he says, is happening in all of our lives. Much to our dismay, we are oftentimes swung to and fro by forces that we can't see and we don't command. And that's why he gives these two illustrations in this passage, in this one that we just read, about the fish and the bird. And he says the fish is swimming along in the ocean, he's having a grand old time, and all of a sudden a cruel net comes and scoops him up and brings him up on the boat, and before he knows it, he's a filet of fish sandwich. That's the way it goes. He says the bird is caught in this snare and he didn't see the snare coming and he's caught and, you know, well, he doesn't say what happens but it's not obviously a good thing. Here's the point. All people are caught by evil times that fall upon them very unexpectedly. Let me give you another example of that. Do you think that the people of Ukraine, the refugees now, had any idea six months ago that they would be fleeing their homes? My answer to that is no. I don't, I don't think that they do know that or would have known that. Why would they have guessed that? 
And here's Solomon's point. We all think that it's not really our reality. It's somebody else's reality. And crime always happens to somebody else. Economic collapse happens to somebody else. Floods happen to somebody else. School shootings happen to somebody else. I have a friend that I want to tell you about today. His name is Chris. And he's one of my pickleball partners. And uh, we've been playing with Chris for quite a while, getting to know him. Knew that he had a son in college and recently found out his son was actually at Notre Dame. He's a smart cookie. Chris and his wife got a phone call three weeks ago. And uh, it was the uh, hospital at South Bend, Indiana. And they said, uh, sir, we'd, we'd like to tell you that your son just came out of surgery and we'd like for you to get on a plane and come right away. Chris said, what, what's happened? He said, well, your son was wrestling with some friends yesterday, just horsing around, and he knocked his head. They didn't think anything of it, but he got up the next morning and he felt uh, dizzy and he felt a headache, took him in and found out that he had a brain aneurysm. So they did surgery on him. Um, looks like he's going to live, that's the good news, but he's got a long road ahead of him of recovery from a traumatic brain injury. And they're going to take him out of college. They're still at the hospital right now, caring for him. But they're going to withdraw him from school and take him home now as part of his um, recovery. I, I, I use that example because there's time and chance that's operating. There are things that they never even considered, nor, nor should they have. They were operating in life, and all of a sudden, this has happened to them. It's their, obviously their new reality. If you think about it, would you pray with me this week for Sean and his recovery? I'm praying for a complete recovery of Sean. And for Chris and his wife, that they would have, well, patience and long-suffering and love that would be poured into their lives. Looks can be deceiving. Things are not always as they seem or as we plan because time and chance are always operating. There's one more here. There's a, one more example, and it's actually uh, this idea. Wisdom applied can be easily forgotten. Things are not always as they seem because wisdom applied can be so easily forgotten. And Solomon now is going to tell us a story. And so he tells us a story starting in verse 16, and this is what he says. Um, there was a little city with a few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. So get the picture here. There is a little tiny city. There's a big king, more powerful. He's breathing down on that city, ready to destroy it. And again, we can have an idea of that thinking about Ukraine against the superpower of Russia. And here it is. Only it doesn't turn out that way because there's a wise man in the city and he figures out a way to make the attack not occur. And, and the king does, goes away and doesn't attack the city. And we're not really told how it happens, but he pulls a rabbit out of the hat somehow. And he's this wise man in the city. And you would think that, well, he would have a statue built of him in the city square. You would think that songs would be sung about the wisdom of this man. You, you, know, you would think there would be a national holiday given to him. But that's not what happens. He is summarily forgotten. That, that's what happens to him. And we have other biblical examples of this kind of wisdom that is good for the moment but is quickly forgotten. The example that's the chief one for me is, again, uh, Joseph. Joseph is in Egypt. Joseph's under the Pharaoh's command. He saves the entire nation from a famine. In fact, most of the known world at that time. And he's so rewarded and so renowned that the, the Pharaoh says, hey, bring the Jewish people and let's make their land here in Egypt and, you know, I'll, I'll be just gracious and give you this land. And yet, this king passes away or this Pharaoh passes away. Another Pharaoh comes onto the scene and he does not remember Joseph. In fact, this is the way uh, Exodus 1.8 says it. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing to came to power in Egypt. And so again, wisdom can be great for the moment, but utterly forgotten in the next breath. And Solomon is not advising us, so don't have wisdom. He says, no, wisdom's a great thing to have. 
Wisdom will help you lead on life. Wisdom will help you to come to know what's important and not important. Wisdom will help you to actually come to know God. But just remember, wisdom when it's expressed, especially in a community, well, it could be forgotten so easily. It's better, but it's not flashy. It's subtle, but it's very easily scorned. Looks can be deceiving, and it's true in moral conduct. It seems as though people who have more lives should have more benefits, but that's not always true. Uh, more, it looks to be deceiving. It's true in skills applied. You'd think that people who have more skills would always be successful, but time and chance are happening, and that's not always the case. And then he says, wisdom is good as far as it goes, but wow, it can be so easily forgotten. And so, again, how do we land this plane? I realize this is kind of a dark passage. It's kind of like a little rain cloud over us today, and it's like, hmm, man, we have enough dreary weather here. Do we need more, actually, from the Bible? And, you know, many consider this passage right here to be the darkest one that Ecclesiastes or that Solomon writes in the book of Ecclesiastes. And so, is this just a giant lament? Is this a passage that says life is hard and then you die? I mean, is that what we're supposed to get from this? No, I think there's something tucked in the middle of this passage that is meant to bring a glimmer of hope, a little flashlight, a little candle flicker that is to be something of, of, of a reward to us or something of a, a perspective to us. And Solomon is going to come back to a common theme. It's fact, fact, it's something that's been a theme for him. I looked it up and Solomon has used this theme that he's going to say right here five times in this book up to this point. Here's what he says when you face uncertain times and when you face times that are frustrating and it seems like vapor, you can't grab onto it. What are you to then lean into? Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 7 is where he goes. Go, eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments always be white let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. And so he's saying here to us, if you can't quite make sense of all of life, enjoy what is immediately in front of you. It's a gift from God. Enjoy in front of you your food. Enjoy in front of you your wine or whatever you have to drink. Enjoy your wife. Enjoy your husband. Enjoy your family. Because all of those are meant to be common graces from the hand of God. And when all else is boiled down, those are the things that matter the most. Again, a story from a personal friend for you today. We have a friend in Colorado. His name is Jeff. Jeff. And my wife and I were in uh, a home group, in, into a community group, with he and his wife for about 10 years. So we know this couple very, very well. Jeff just uh, retired last year, and he went to the doctor for his physical and found out that he has colorectal cancer in stage three. I was like, that is not what he wanted to hear for retirement. Jeff told us something that's very valuable through this time. He said, here's what's happened. What's happened is I am more highly valuing friends and family like never before because that's what's important. It was great news when they told me that my treatment, although it's going to be long and there's going to be surgery involved, is very treatable and I get to go to my, my son's wedding in May. That's what matters the most to me. Simple things like the Super Bowl party they experienced a few weeks ago. Just being together with family, it mattered so much to him. A walk around the neighborhood mattered so much to him. And when you start boiling all of life down, it's the simple things right in front of us, the relationships in front of us, the simple pleasures that God affords to us, those are the things that matter, especially when life can seem so unpredictable and out of control. Now, again, he's not saying don't ever do planning. Planning can be good, but he's saying plan with an asterisk. Because you have no guarantee of what you are planning for. Moreover, we again enjoy the things that are the daily pleasures immediately before us. Looks can be deceiving. Life does not always go as planned. And this is what drives us to trust God for what we cannot see. 
And it leaves us to enjoy the blessings that are immediately ours that we don't have to wait for and are right in front of us every day. Looks can be deceiving. We trust God in the midst of those times. Father, uh, I just admit this is a hard passage for me. And I thank you for bringing some level of clarity to my life on it. And I pray that's the case also with my friends. What you're reminding us is that we may think things are one way, but they could be completely another. And you are the true north in the midst of all of our struggles, our trials, our difficulties. And all of those things perhaps conspire in order that we would come and we would find you. And we would find your enduring way, your alpha and omega way. And so, Lord, we just confess our inability to always get our arms around life today. And we find you as our anchor. We lift our lives to you today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.